Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. May I have your attention, please? Thank you. Raise your hand if you did not get red mark for today, the 12th of November. So let's go ahead and get started. We've got two more days, two more days in the unit. Today we're going to continue simplifying radical expressions. All right. Next class will be solving equations involving radicals, and then we'll have a review day before our test. All right. Let's go ahead and get started. We know a radical expression is not fully simplified if it contains any perfect nth powers inside. And right now, number one is a square root. So in order to simplify that fully, I need to go through and find any perfect square factors that are hiding inside of the radical. Let's go ahead and take a look. Is 108 a perfect square number? Well, no. I look at my half sheets and I see 10 squared is 100, 11 squared is 121, and 108 lies between. So it's not a perfect square number. And yet, this radical is not fully simplified because 108 contains perfect square factor, a perfect square factor that divides evenly into it without a remainder. Raise your hand if you found the largest perfect square number that divides evenly into 108. What's that? Ben C? 36. 36. Great. So we'll go ahead and break up that 108 as 36 times 1, 2, 3. So we'll break up. Actually, I'm going to go grab a little bit more space. So we'll break up that 108 as 36 times 3. Now, 108 has lots of factors. Right? We could have done a different pairing of factors. However, we're choosing 36 mm -hmm. times 3 because 36 is the largest perfect square that divides evenly into 108. And I know a perfect square number inside of my square root will simplify to an integer out front. Meanwhile, I have x to the fifth. x to the fifth right, is not a perfect square. It's, its exponent is not divisible by the index on the radical, which is an invisible 2 because it's a square root. So what I'll do is rewrite that x to the fifth as a product of powers. A product of powers where my exponents, right, where my exponent is divisible by the index on the radical. Let's take a look. What's the next highest exponent beneath 5 that is divisible by 2? 4. four. So I'll break up x to the fifth as x to the fourth times x to the first. <laughs> That's still x to the fifth in green, but now this is a perfect square. x to the fourth will simplify to a uh, power with integer exponent out front. And we've got one to go. It looks like y to the eighth still needs to be simplified. So y to the eighth right now is already a perfect square. I don't need to break up my y power because its current exponent 8 is divisible by the index on the radical, the, the 2. So it's already a perfect square. All right, let's go ahead and grab onto my perfect squares, and I'll squiggle and line those. This 36 is a perfect square. x to the fourth is a perfect square. y to the eighth is a perfect square. All of those will simplify to integer quantities out front, and then I'll still have some remaining stuff inside. So let's do it. Here we go. The, the square root of 36 is, Aaron? Thank you. x to the four divided by two is x squared. y to the eighth divided by two is y to the fourth. And I still have the square root of, and it looks like inside we still have a 3 and an x. Is that correct? A 3 and an x. Raise your hand if you already had number 1. Did you get there with the with the powers? Way to go, you guys. That's great. What questions do you have about number 1? It can be tricky when we combine variable expressions in my radicals as well. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at number 2 then. Let's take a look at number 2. In number 2, I have a product. I have a product of fourth roots. And so I think the best first step is to rewrite as a single fourth root and then do the reducing just like number one. So here we go. The product property allows me to go both forwards and backwards. That is to say, I can break up a product inside a radical as a product of multiple radicals, but I can also take a product of two radicals and combine as a, as a single radical with a product inside. Let's do that. So my first step is I'll go ahead and rewrite this as a single radical. It'll be a fourth root of 1250. And it looks like we have b to the... 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, so b to the 6th, and then c to the 5th, and then d to the 2nd. Did we get everybody? Awesome. Now let's go ahead and start our quest, our quest to reduce this radical. We're looking for not perfect squares, but perfect fourth powers. How come? Because my index on the radical is a 4, right? We're looking for a fourth root, so we need to find perfect fourth powers inside. I know any perfect fourth powers inside of a fourth root will simplify to an integer out front. Let's find it. So is 1250 a perfect fourth power? Well, I go on my sheet, and it looks like 1250 is not a perfect fourth power, and yet 625 is, right? 625 is a perfect fourth power. Let's go ahead and rewrite this fourth root. 
let's rewrite this fourth root then as 625 times 2 or 1250. We'll go ahead and break up this b to the 6 in the same way we did up top. We're looking for the exponent to be divisible by the index. And right now, is 6 divisible by 4 without a remainder? No, so I'll break up this b power in green into a product of b power. I'll break it up as b to the exponent. The next exponent beneath 6 that is divisible by 4 is 4 itself. So b to the 4th times b to the 2nd, that's b to the 6th, double underlined green. c to the, c to the 5th, that exponent currently is not divisible by the index of my radical 4, so I'll chunk that down into 2 powers as well. c to the next highest exponent beneath 5 that is divisible by the index of the radical is 4 to the, and then times c to the 1st. And lastly, we've got my d power, d squared is not going to be reduced. d squared is not going to be reduced, and so I'll leave that underneath my radical. Awesome. Let's go ahead and grab onto our perfect, our perfect fourth power then. We've got 625 is the perfect fourth power. b to the fourth is the perfect fourth power. c to the fourth is the perfect fourth power. Let's go ahead and check my final answer. So here we go. 625, the fourth root of 625. Everybody find it. Look on your half sheet. And what's that, Katie? Five. Five. Thank you. The fourth root of b to the fourth is b to the four divided by four is just b to the first, or I'll write b c to the four divided by four is c to the first, and that's it. I still have times the fourth root of, and inside we still got our two b squared c d squared. So you get everybody. Inside we still had our two b squared c d squared wasn't going to reduce at all. Awesome. What questions do you guys have about this second one? Dakota. Well, uh, for this 8? Yeah. Absolutely correct. 8 is not a perfect square, but we're talking about y to the 8. y to the 8 is a perfect square. How come? Because we can find something such that when multiplied by itself equals y to the 8. What times itself equals y to the 8? Let's see. y to the question mark times y to the question mark equals y to the 8. So what would what multiplied by itself would equal y to the 8? Yes, y to the 4th times y to the 4th would be y to the 4 plus 4, right? y to the 8. And so y to the 4th squared multiplied by itself equals y to the 8. And so when we're dealing with a variable expression, we're not seeing if the exponent number is a perfect square, eight's not a perfect square. We're seeing if the power is a perfect square, and we can do that by considering, right, what exponents are divisible by, divisible by the index on the radical. So is eight divisible by two, a square root? It is, so it's a perfect square. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Awesome. Great, other questions on the first slide? All right, I'm gonna go ahead and box this bad boy then. We want pdf to come up, baby. pdf -able. All right, wow, we've got a whole bunch of cube roots together multiplied. I'm going to go ahead and rewrite that as a single cube root in accordance with my product property for radicals. Let's do a single cube root. Here we go. 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. x times x squared times x is x to the 4th. y times y to the 5th times y is y to the 7th. Did we get everybody? Awesome. So are you guys ready for the trick? I feel like we, we did some time, right? We put in our hard effort breaking up my powers, breaking up my powers into, into products, right? X to the fifth times X to the first is X to the sixth and so on and so forth. Let's go ahead and see if we can't utilize now our shortcut division for powers. When we raise a power to a power, our shortcut operation is multiplication. So if we take the root of a power, we can undo that and use division. Let's see if we can try that out. So right now, 8 is a perfect cube. All right, 8 is a perfect cube, so that'll simplify to an integer out front. What's the cube root of 8? Bring 2. 2. And now we've seen how this exponent, this x to the fourth, needs to be divisible by that 3 in order to reduce to an integer power out front. But we could also consider this nth root, right? This 
cube root as the one-third power. And think of this as a single power, x to the four-thirds. My index on the radical, 3, or denominator on my fractional exponent, 3, goes into this exponent, 4, how many whole times? 3 goes into 4, how many whole times? Carson? 1. 1 whole times, so there's going to be 1x out front, and then <coughs> with how many remaining? Well, with 1 remaining, there's going to be 1x remaining inside. So 3 goes into 4, 1 whole time with 1 left over. There's my 1 whole x out front, and there's my 1x left over inside. Let's try it with the y power. Currently, my exponent 7 is not divisible by 3 without a remainder, but my index 3 does fit into my exponent. How many times does 3 go into 7? How many whole times? Twice. Two whole times, and so there'd be a y squared out front with how many remaining? With one left over. So we could rewrite this as y to the 7 thirds, and then reduce my rational exponents using an improper fraction. My d index on my radical 3 goes into 7 two whole times with one left over. There's y to the second out front, and there's one remaining inside. You guys see that? We could do this the long way as well, and rewrite y to the 7th as y to the 6th times y to the 1st, and then what's the cube root of y to the 6th? Well, that's y to the 6th divided by 3 is still y squared. So you can do this either way. This is just a shorter way now that we've done several, several simplifications. What questions do you guys have about number 3? Awesome, awesome. All right, so we'll go ahead and box that bad boy. And then we'll go ahead and take care of our homework check. And so for our homework check, I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. Uh, I started posting the recordings then right away on A days. So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording during our, our homework checks so that we're not giving B day students answers. So thank you for your help, ladies and gentlemen. Let's take a look at our content objectives for the day. We're going to continue evaluating radical expressions particularly those radical expressions that include fractions, right? The F word, either fractions inside of the radical or radicals in the, in the, in the bottom of a fraction. So we're going to figure out how to handle both cases today and le learn a new technique. That technique will be called rationalize the denominator. And that'll be a strategy we'll use to get rid of a radical when it's in the bottom of a fraction. That's not okay to have a final answer that has a radical in the bottom of a fraction. That's not considered fully simplified. So we're going to add that to our requirements for simplified radical expression. So whenever we simplify an expression, we rewrite the expression into an equivalent form using our balanced mathematical rules. Our focus today is to simplify expressions with have fractions involved in the radical expression. So again, we're going to be using our product property for radicals and our quotient property for radicals, just like last class. First thing, we must remove any perfect nth powers that are factors inside a radical. And so in that square root of 50x to the fifth, that is not fully simplified because inside that 50 is a perfect square factor hiding. There's a perfect square factor that divides evenly into 50 without a remainder. Inside of that x to the fifth power, there's a perfect square factor that divides evenly into x to the fifth. And so this is not fully simplified, but we saw from our bell that we can rewrite that 50 as, what's the next highest uh, perfect square? What's the perfect square factor that divides evenly into 50? Um, Taylor? 25. 25, thank you. So I'll rewrite 50 as 25 times 2. And we've seen how we can break up that x to the fifth as a product of powers. I'll do so now. Remember that x to the fifth could be rewritten as x to the next highest exponent beneath 5 that is divisible by 2. That would be x to the fourth times x to the first, and then we can go ahead and simplify my perfect squares inside my radical, right? 25 is a 5 out front. x to the fourth would become x to the 4 divided by 2 is x to the second out front, and I still have square root of 2x inside. And so I could rewrite the square root of 50x to the fifth as 5x squared root 2x. Now it's fully simplified. Now it's fully simplified. Okay, can we try our shortcut really quickly, see how our, short our shortcut works? If we had stopped at the original and said, what's the index on a square root? Well, the invisible index on that square root is a 2. How many times does 2 go into 5, the x <coughs> power? Well, 2 goes into 5 how many whole times? Two whole times is how many left over? One. Guess what? We've got x to the second power out front and 
one leftover remaining inside. You guys see that? So the shortcut's kind of nice once we understand right, where it comes from. Awesome. Number two is brand new. And so it's not okay to have a fraction inside a radical. Someone who made up our, our simplification rules, our, our conventions for mathematics, right? Just like we don't write x2 plus 7, right? We don't write y equals x2 plus 7. We write y equals 2x plus 7. We've also decided it's not, it's not good math manners to have a fraction inside of a radical expression. So we're not going to rewrite it like this. Instead, what we're going to do is break it up, break it up as a quotient of individual radicals, and then simplify. Okay, And we'll see if we can't get rid of that fraction inside. So our first step would be to break this up and rewrite as a quotient of radicals, individual radicals. So the square root of 5 ninths is the square root of 5 over the square root of 9. Once we do that, lo and behold, we have generated a perfect square inside of a square root. That's equivalent to an integer. And so in this case, we don't have any more work to do. The root 5 is OK to have a radical on top. That's fully simplified. And on bottom, we have the square root of 9. That is an integer. What's the square root of 9? You can call out 3. And so my final answer would be root 5 over 3. It's OK to have a radical expression that involves a fraction. We just can't have a fraction inside of a radical. And we can't have a radical in the bottom of a fraction. Neither of those requirements is violated for number two, and so that's fully simplified. That's fully simplified. All right, now let's take a look at number three. It's okay to have a root five on top and a regular three on bottom, but look at number three. It's not okay to have a regular three on top and a radical on the bottom. So while number two is fully simplified in green and box black, Number three is not fully simplified. It's not, it's not good math manners to have a radical in the denominator of a fraction. So what are we going to do? We're going to use a technique called rationalizing the denominator. And that's our new technique for the day. To rationalize the denominator, it means to get rid of any radical expressions that are in the bottom of a fraction. Our technique for doing that, rationalizing the denominator, is to fully simplify radicals. Right? We want to fully simplify any radicals. And then, if any radicals remain, in this case they do, we're going to multiply top and bottom by that problem radical. When we multiply top and bottom by that problem radical, we're just multiplying the original expression by 1. right? We're not changing its value, but we're changing the way it appears because now they'll get rid of the radical and bottom. Let me show you what I mean. We're going to multiply top and bottom by the problem radical after trying to reduce. Does the square root of 5 reduce at all? No, it doesn't reduce at all. It's fully simplified. But it's not OK to have a radical in the bottom of a fraction. So we're going to multiply top and bottom by the problem radical. That is root 5. And when we do that, watch what happens. Straight across is my technique for multiplying fractions. So I do 3 times root 5 is 3 root 5. Right? I can't jump in and write root 15 because my first 3 was not a radical. So I can't use the product property. I'll just do 3 times root 5 is 3 root 5. And then check it on the bottom. <coughs> Root 5 times root 5 is the square root of 25, which itself is 5. Anytime I multiply a radical by itself, I get rid of the radical and I'm left with the quantity inside. That is to say, the square root of 5 times the square root of 5 is just 5. And while number, the beginning of number 3, 3 over root 5, was not fully simplified, this expression is fully simplified. Because I don't have a fraction inside of a radical, and I don't have a radical in the bottom of a fraction, and I don't have any perfect square factors hiding inside of a radical. So guess what? This is fully simplified. And so each time we're going to check our three requirements. Are there any perfect nth powers hiding inside of an nth root? That's requirement one. Are there any fractions hiding inside of a radical? That's not allowed. That would be requirement two. And thirdly, are there any radicals in the bottom of a fraction? Well, now there's not. So this satisfies all three requirements. It is fully simplified in blue. Let's go ahead and try some. First, are there any perfect squares hiding inside of a radical? Well, it appears as though, right, 11 thirds is not a perfect square. Is 11, is 11 a perfect square? So let's break this up. We're not okay to have, it's not okay to have a fraction inside a radical. So let's rewrite it as a quotient of individual radicals. That's root 11 over root 3. Now I'll try to reduce. Does the square root of 11 reduce at all? No, 11 is prime. Does the square root of 3 reduce? No, 3 is prime. And so I can't reduce the radicals anymore. So I've gotten rid of a fraction inside of a radical, and yet this is still not fully simplified. How come? Because I have a radical in the bottom of a fraction, and that's not OK. That's my third requirement. 
no problem. We've got a new technique. It's called rationalizing the denominator. And that will allow me to rewrite this expression in such a way that there's no more radical in the bottom of fractal. We'll reduce our radicals all the way. We have. We can't go any further. And we'll multiply top and bottom by the problem radical. The problem radical is root 3. I don't care about a root 11 in the top, but it's not OK to have a root 3 in the bottom. So we'll multiply top and bottom by root 3. Notice how that blue root 3 over root 3 is just 1. It's equivalent to 1. So we're not changing the value of the original. We're just changing its appearance. Now we'll go ahead and multiply straight across. Root 11 times root 3 is root 33 in accordance with the product property. Because these are both radicals I could read of the same type, I could rewrite as a single square root of a product. On bottom, though, check out what happens. Root 3 times root 3 is 3 itself. So the square root of 3 times the square root of 3. Long way would be the square root of 9, which equals 3. Short way would be squaring a square root, undoes it, and gets you the quantity inside. In either case, we are now left with an expression that is fully simplified. Are there any fractions inside of a radical? No. Are there any radicals in the bottom of a fraction? No. Are there any perfect squares hiding inside of a square root? No. I'm done. Box it. Stick a fork in it, because we're done. That's it. In number two, are there any fractions inside of a radical, like number one? No, there's no fractions inside of a radical. And yet, it's not fully simplified for two reasons. One, I have a perfect square factor hiding inside of a square root. That's not OK. And two, I have a radical expression in the bottom of a fraction. That's not OK either. Before we do any rationalizing, let's try to reduce our radicals all the way. So we'll leave that 5 alone on top. We'll leave that 5 alone on top. But we're going to hop inside that root 45x and break up that 45 as a product, a product where one factor is a perfect square. What's the largest perfect square that divides evenly into 45 without a remainder? What's the largest perfect square factor that divides evenly into 45 without a remainder? Olivia? Nine. Nine, thank you. So we'll rewrite that 45 as 9 times 5. Then we still have our x inside the radical. So we still have our x inside the radical. x is not a perfect square. It's not going to reduce. We did this so we can simplify our radical fully and be left with smaller numbers in my radical when I have to do my rationalizing eventually. So here we go. We'll rewrite now. I've got 5 on top still. But on bottom, we've got 3 root 5x. By simplifying the root 45x, now my problem radical is a smaller number, smaller radical, so I don't have to do bigger numbers in multiplication in my multiplication when I multiply without a calculator. I don't have to multiply by root 45x, which you could have done in the beginning. It's just now you have bigger numbers and you have to simplify after. I'm trying to avoid that. So here we go. Let's multiply top and bottom by my problem radical. My problem radical is root 5x. So we'll multiply top and bottom by root 5x. When I multiply fractions, my technique is straight across. So we're going to multiply straight across. Let's do that. So I've got 5 times root 5x. These are not both radicals, so I can't use the product property. That's just going to be 5 root 5x on top. 5 root 5x on top. Pop down to the bottom. I still have the 3. But now I have root 5x times root 5x. What's root 5x times itself? Okay. Just 5x. When I multiply a radical by itself, right, that is squaring a square root, it undoes the square root and gets the quantity inside out front. So 5x. Nice job. And now I can go ahead and simplify what factors do you notice in common on both top and <coughs> bottom? There is a common factor both on top and bottom. It looks like this 5 and this 5 can divide out and equal 1, which means my final answer, I would still have a root 5x on top over, on bottom of what I have, still have the 3, still have the x, so I'll have 3x. Are there any perfect square factors hiding inside of a square root? No. Are there any fractions inside of a radical? No. Are there any radicals in the bottom of a fraction? No that we haven't violated any of our three requirements, so we're done. We'll go ahead and box it. That's fully simplified. Awesome. What questions do you guys have about number two? Olivia. Do you want us to, like, the order of doing the 
x first for that economic theory? Do I want you to simplify it first? Yeah, instead of multiplying by 45. You could multiply by root 45x first. When you do that, you'll have to reduce second. I encourage you to consider reducing first because then your multiplication numbers are smaller. But sometimes it doesn't matter. So you can do it either way because it's equivalent. <coughs> it's just that by, by reducing first, we only had to multiply by root 5x as opposed to root 45x. And so that made a little bit small. Either way is fine. You should get the same result. Other questions about 2? All right, let's take a look at our third one. Let's go ahead and simplify. Let's go ahead and simplify again with fractions and a rational exponent. So this is like last, this is like two classes ago. We need to be able to simplify, right, an expression involving a rational exponent, whether it's positive or negative. So remember, negative exponents don't mean negative answers. Negative exponents mean reciprocal. So we'll rewrite with positive exponents by flipping the base and rewriting with a positive exponent. That is to say, 27 340 thirds to the negative 2 thirds is the same as 343 27 to the positive 2 thirds. I can rewrite the reciprocal of the base raised to the positive exponent. So now I've applied my negative exponent. Now I'll purposely apply the denominator of my fraction as an nth root first. And so I know that the 343 27ths to the 2 thirds, right, is the same as the cube root of 343 27ths. The cube root of that, that's the 1 third power, and then I'll raise to the numerator exponent, the 2 second. So see that? We've purposely chosen to apply the denominator of my rational exponent first as an nth root, get an intermediate result, and then raise that to the numerator exponent second. All right, get ready, because I'm going to call on you. What is the cube root of 343? Everybody find it. Cube root of 343. Heather. Thank you. Over. Cube root of 27. Everybody find it. Marina. Three. Three. Thank you. Still have to raise this to the numerator exponent, that 2 last, which means my final answer is, everybody find it, 7 squared. Andrew. 49. Thank you. Over. 3 squared. Olivia B. 9. Nine. Nine. Thank you. So my final answer would be 49 ninths. That's old news, right? Old news. We've already done that, but it's a good refresher with our with our nth roots. A fractional exponent is an nth root. All right. Now let's go ahead and handle. Wow. Put it all together. We've got a fourth root of a fraction and variable expression. And so four looks like the big bad mother daddy of them all. Let's see if we can't tackle that. So the first thing we want to do is check and see if we can reduce our fraction. Well, our 32 over 81 reduces all. Let's see, 32 is just made of twos and 81 is just made of threes. And so we're not going to be able to reduce 32 over 81. Um, however, it is inside of a fourth root, and so it looks as though we will be able to reduce the 32 and the 81. I think those those are hiding perfect fourth powers. They are. Okay, so I can't reduce my original fraction, which means I want to apply my quotient property of radicals in reverse. So I'll go ahead and break this up as the fourth root of numerator over the fourth root of denominator. Everybody, let's do that. So the fourth root of 32x to the 8y to the 13th. Over the fourth root of 81z to the 20th. Now I'll go ahead and try to reduce my radical. Is 32 a perfect fourth power? Well, let's look on my sheet. Is 32 a per perfect fourth power? No, it's not. But it does contain a perfect fourth power that's a factor, right? What's the largest perfect fourth power that's a factor of 32? Looks like 16. Yes, 16. So let's go ahead and break up that 32 as 16 times 2. Meanwhile, x to the 8, is this currently a perfect fourth power? Yes, the exponent on the x power 
is divisible by the index of a radical. So x to the eighth is a perfect fourth power, so I'll leave that alone. We're going to simplify that. And then y to the 13th, that's not a perfect fourth power because its current exponent, 13, is not divisible by the index of a radical 4. So I'm going to break that up as a product of powers. What's the next highest exponent beneath 13 that is divisible by 4? Well, that would be 12. Then times y to the first, that's still y to the 13th. But now I have an exponent that is divisible by the index of my radical. All over, on bottom. Hey guys, look. I already have a fourth, a fourth power inside of my fourth root. Everybody find it. What's the fourth root of the fourth root of 81? Everybody find it. Ty? Three. Three, thank you. What's the fourth root of z to the 20th? That's already a perfect fourth power. What's the fourth root of z to the 20th? Eric? Z to the 10th. Absolutely. Thank you. Look at Eric said z to the 20th divided by 4, z to the 20th divided by 4 is z to the 5th. He treated that nth root as a rational exponent. You can divide the exponent by the index of the radical. Great. And we're almost done, you guys. Now we need to reduce our perfect fourth powers inside of the numerator, and we'll be done. So here we go. The fourth root of 16, everybody find it on your half sheet. What's the fourth root of 16? Go ahead and tell the class when I call on you. Will? Two. Two, thank you. Fourth root of x to the eighth. Fourth root of x to the eighth. Mark? Um, wait, what? The fourth root of x to the eighth. Oh, x squared. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. That's x to the eighth divided by four is x to the second. And I still have the fourth root of, and inside what do we have? We still have two. Oh, we need the y. We need the y power too. This is a perfect, this is a perfect fourth root. So what's the fourth root of y to the twelfth? Right, what's the fourth root of y to the twelfth? Adam? Good. Thank you. So now we've simplified our perfect fourth powers inside. Inside we still have remaining two. Y. That's it. All over. And in our denominator, we just have the three. Z to the fifth. Oh yeah. All right. What questions do you have about four? It's printable. All right. So now let's go ahead and take a look at our realm of real numbers. This textbook has made a point of defining my fractional exponents to only apply for positive bases. This way, my rules for simplifying fractions still hold true, whether or not I'm dealing with a regular number fraction or an exponent that's a fraction. So once again, it's not okay in this class to have a negative base if my exponent is a fraction. However, I can have a negative base if I have an integer exponent, either positive or negative, no problem. And so we can have integer exponents on both positive and negative bases, no problem. It's fine to have a negative base when we're raising to any integer exponent. We can only have we can only have positive bases if we have a fractional exponent. And so this last one, negative 8 to the 3 halves, is not allowed in this course. That's not going to be a real number in this course because of the exponent was a fraction. It's not okay to have a negative base. Oh, uh-oh. What about this third one? Why isn't this third one crossed off? Why isn't that third one crossed off too? Adam? Because it doesn't include a negative. Absolutely. The base is only 8. The base in this power is 8 to the two-thirds, and then applying the negative. And so these are two very different things. In this one, there were parentheses, so they're saying the base, the entire base is negative. That's not allowed. In this one, it's fine, because the base is 8. And then times the negative, because the order of operation. We can have even roots of positive bases only. So if we have an even root, like a square root, or a fourth root, or an eighth root, then the quantity inside must be positive. Otherwise, it's non-real, right? It's a non-real answer. And so we can't have a negative inside of a square root. Lastly, if we're dealing with an odd radical, then it's just fine to have negatives inside. What multiplied by itself? 3 times equals negative 27, negative 3. And so it's okay if we have a radical with an odd index, then we're going to allow negative bases. It's not okay to have, it's not okay to have a fractional exponent, right? A fractional exponent when we have negative bases because the book has chosen to disallow negative bases anytime there's a fractional exponent. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at these two things. 
let's see why the fractional exponent's not allowed. So you might be thinking, wait a minute, I thought the cube root of negative 27 was negative 3. Yes, the cube root of negative 27 is negative 3. However, if we write that as a fractional exponent, one third, then we're not going to allow negative 27 as an input because now my exponent is a fraction and we're not going to allow negative bases for fractional exponents. How come? Because my rules for simplifying fractions then won't hold true. What if I wanted to find, right, if I wanted to find negative 27 to the 2 6 power? What if I wanted to find negative 27 to the 1 3rd power and I allowed negative bases? Well, this would be saying, what's the third root of negative 27? The third root of negative 27 would be negative 3, because negative 3 cubed, that is multiplied by itself three times, equals negative 27. Does that equal question mark negative 27 to the 2 sixths? Well, in this case, I would take negative 27 and take the, I would square it, right, and see whatever that is, and then I'd, I'd get some positive number, and then I take the sixth root of that positive number, and I get a positive 3. Does negative 3 equal a positive 3? No, it does not. At the same time, what if I try to do the 6th root of negative 27 first, and then raise to the second power? Well, if I try to do the 6th root of negative 27, right, no number multiplied by itself 6 times equals a negative, and so this would be a non-real answer on the right-hand side. You guys see that? That was the coolest thing I've ever seen. You guys see that? This warrants investigation. <laughs> That's pretty bomb. So you guys know what I'll be doing during my during my planning period. Yeah. All right, great. So in either case, we run into a problem, right? We've created a contradiction. So it's not okay to have a negative base, right, if we have a fractional exponent. Negative 3 does not equal 3 clearly, nor does negative 3 equal a non-real number. All right. So, oh, sorry. So let's summarize right here. Look, this is, a, this is the point. We can have, right, we can have a negative, right, a negative inside of a fractional, a fractional exponent power. But we can have a negative inside an odd index radical. We can't have a negative inside of an even index radical because that will never equal a negative number. We're allowed to have positives inside a fractional and positive inside of even roots. All right, let's go ahead and do some practice then. So right now we're going to rationalize the denominator and write a fully simplified expression. So let's go ahead and do the first one. Can I reduce the square root of 3? No, and so it's time to rationalize. Go ahead and do that with your partner and show me you get how to get rid of a radical in the bottom of a fraction using our technique called rationalizing the denominator. Check with your partner and be ready to share. Okay, so in the first one, we'll multiply top and bottom by the problem radical, which is root 3. Notice how root 3 over root 3 in green is just 1. We're not changing the value of the original. We're just changing its appearance. I multiply it straight across. 1 times root 3 is root 3. And on the bottom, watch what happens to the radical. Root 3 times root 3 is just 3 straight up. Now I don't have a radical in, in the bottom of a fraction. I don't have a fraction inside of a radical. And I don't contain any perfect square factors inside of a square root. So I've satisfied all three requirements. And number one is fully simplified now. Raise your hand if you have the same thing for number one. Same thing for number one. Great. I see lots of you starting number, two, uh, number six. And that's awesome. It's just that you're multiplying by root 12. That's OK. You can multiply top and bottom by root 12. That is a problem radical, right? Except you're going to have to reduce after the fact. Right? Because now you're going to have a, a radical on top that contains a perfect square factor. So what I encourage you to do, consider doing, and you don't have to, but I would encourage you to consider reducing first and then multiplying 
second by the problematic code because it'll be smaller numbers. Either way is fine. So you keep going with your root 12. I'm going to go ahead and reduce my bottom fraction first. I'm going to break up my 12 as 4 times 3. When I do that, I create a smaller, a smaller radical. So I'm going to now get 3 over 2 root 3. And now I can multiply top and bottom by just a root 3 instead of a root 12. Do you see that? So by reducing first, you make smaller numbers. You can still multiply by root 12, but you'll have to reduce twice. You'll have to reduce then your, your radical and then see if there's any common factors those divide out. All right, so I'm going to multiply top and bottom by root 3, my problem radical. When I do that, straight across, 3 times root 3 is 3 root 3. Over, on the bottom I have 2 times root 3 times root 3. Well, the 2, all right, I'll leave there for a moment. Root 3 times root 3 is just 3 straight up. And now I can cancel out the factor of 3 on top, the factor of 3 on bottom, and get a final answer of root 3 <coughs> over 2. Now, many of you multiplied by root 12 right in the beginning. Let's see what happened there. 3 root 12 over 12, right, is going to reduce in two different ways. 3 root 12 over 12, I can reduce the 3 over 12 and get 1 over 4. And then I have to go back and reduce the root 12 into 2 root 3, and then reduce the 2 over 4 as 1 over 2, and finally I can get root 3 over 2. And so you can do it with root 12, but you have to now reduce twice after the fact. I encourage you to consider reducing first, and then multiplying by a smaller radical, because there's one less reducing. What questions do you guys have was that? All right, let's take a look at our number 15. Suppose the diagonal of the square is 12 centimeters. Find the length of a side of the square. Please make a drawing. So let's go ahead and make a sketch. I think a shape tool would be appropriate in this case. So we've got a square. Let's suppose that the diagonal of the square is 12 centimeters. So if the diagonal of my square is 12 centimeters, can we figure out the side length of the square? Well, I think we can. If this is a square, I know we have a right angle. And if we have a right angle, my diagonal divides this into, into a right triangle with side length x and x and 12. What equation, what relationship exists between my side lengths, x and x and 12, in a right triangle? Katie? Square square. Absolutely. And so once I have a right triangle, I can utilize the Pythagorean theorem. In general, a squared plus b squared equals c squared for leg lengths a and b, and then hypotenuse length c. In my picture, I don't have a's or b's or c's. What do I have? Ben? Just x. Good. So this would be awesome. X squared plus X squared equals, well, careful, it would be 12 squared because my diagonal is 12. Great. So I get like terms. X squared plus another X squared is a total of 2X squared equals 12 squared is 144. Dividing both sides by 2 will get my X squared alone. And I get X squared equals 144 divided by 2 is what? 72? 72? Awesome. If I wanted to solve for x, what operation will undo the squaring? Right? What operation will undo squaring? Dakota? Square rooting. And so we'll take the positive and negative square root to solve. If x squared equals 72, then x must be given by the positive and negative square root of 72. Sometimes this will reduce, sometimes it won't. In general, we break this up into two solutions. However, we're dealing with a triangle. Can a triangle have a side length x that's negative root 72? No. And so this is a situation where we would, we would disallow the negative, even though we know in solving an equation we must consider it. We would disallow that because we can't have a negative side length. A 
final reducing root 72 is equivalent to root 36 times 2 and the greatest perfect square factor 36 will reduce inside of the square root to the integer 6 out front. So my final answer is x equals 6 root 2. And what will the label on my x side length be? What will the units be for that? Tyler? Centimeters. Centimeters, thank you. That's pretty sweet. Oh, yeah. Now let's play the, the radical game. What? The radical game, like the awesome game, the cool game, the fabulous game? Yes, we're going to play the radical game with roots. We want to pay close attention to the inputs in my radicals. Are they positive versus negative, and is that allowed? So first up, number one, is it okay to have a negative inside of a cube root, an odd index radical? Yes, it is, because there is a number that multiplies by itself three times and produces a negative result. And so one is just fine. What multiplied by itself three times equals negative one? Well, negative one itself. What multiplied by itself four times equals negative 16? Nothing. It's not okay to have a negative inside of an even root. And so because we have an even index radical, and number two, it's not okay to have a negative inside of it. And so we're not going to allow negative inputs inside of an uneven index radical in the realm of real numbers. And so it does not exist. Well, I should say non-real. Non-real answer. Number four, everybody look. Is the index even or odd in number four? Eric? Uh, odd. odd. Is it okay to have a negative number inside of an odd index radical? Jackson? Yeah. Yes, it's just fine. So we'll just simplify this as negative and then cube root of top over cube root of bottom. Everybody find it. Cube root of 125, find it on your sheet. Tell the class when I'm calling you. So what's my cube root of 125? Barrett? Five, thank you. So this simplifies to <coughs> negative one fifth. Nice job. <coughs> Number five, we can do that a couple different ways. Is it okay to have a negative quantity inside of a fifth root? Well, we don't even know if that's negative yet. First, let's do the power. Negative 10 to the 15th, would that be positive or negative? That would be negative because we're multiplying a negative an odd number of times, right? And so that would be still be negative. But the index on my radical is odd, so that's okay. So I could rewrite this as negative 10 to the 15 divided by 5, and that would be negative 10 to the third, and then this does exist. Negative 10 to the third would equal negative 10 times negative 10 times negative 10, so that would be negative 1,000. Is that right on your half sheet? Awesome. It's pretty sweet. All right, let's go ahead and try some higher index radicals. The cube root of negative 27, 8 to the 12th, it's okay to have a negative inside of a cube root, so we'll break this up. Is my current exponent 12 divisible by the index on the radical? Yes, and so I can do this in one step. The cube root of negative 27 is negative 3. a to the 12 divided by 3 is a to the 4. One step and we're done. Fifth root of negative 12 over x to the fifth times fifth root of negative 40 over x to the tenth. I'll go ahead and rewrite that as a single fifth root first. And so let's do that as a single fifth root first. That would equal the fifth root of, and we'll go straight across. Negative times negative is positive. 12 times 40 is, oh goodness, 48, 480, 480 over x to the 5th times x to the 10th is x to the 15th. Is it okay to have a positive number inside of an odd index radical? Yes, it's okay to have a positive number inside of any index radical. We only have to worry about negatives, and then only when we have an even index radical. Is 480 a perfect fifth power? Well, let's look at our half sheet. Is 480 a perfect fifth power? 
No, it's not. And so we need to find the greatest perfect fifth power that divides evenly into 480. So everybody, let's look at our perfect fifth powers. We've got 2 to the fifth is 32. 3 to the fifth is 243. 4 to the fifth is... What's 4 to the fifth? Oh gosh, so our only hope is 32? So does 32 go into 480? It does! So big! Things are looking up. So we're going to go ahead and break that up as the fifth root of 480 is 32 times. And how many times does 32 go into that? 15 times. Over x to the 15th and the fifth root, and now we'll grab our perfect, we'll grab our perfect fifth power. So there's one. So 32 is a perfect fifth power. Here's one. How do I know that x to the 15th is a perfect fifth power? Olivia. Absolutely. My current exponent is divisible by the index on the radical. Therefore, this is a perfect fifth power. Let's go ahead and finish it up. Fifth root of 32 is 2. Still have 5th root of 15, that won't reduce. However, on bottom I do have an integer power, that's x to the 3rd. Are there any fractions inside of a radical? No. Are there any radicals in the bottom of a fraction? No. Are there any perfect 5th powers hiding inside of a 5th root? No. We're fully simplified. Locked it. Nice job. Alright, we've got one to go. And we're not evaluating. So do not evaluate. We're just thinking about if the answer would be positive, negative, or undefined in the realm of real numbers. And so in the realm of real numbers, would each of these be positive, negative, or undefined? Let's go ahead and, let's go ahead and take a look. So negative 3 to the 5th, would the result be positive, negative, or undefined? Positive, negative, or undefined? What do you think about for that first one? Logan? Negative. negative. Raise your hand if you agree with a little bit. Negative. That's correct. If I multiply a negative number, bless you, by itself an odd number of times, the result will be overall <coughs> negative. Number 15. Do negative exponents mean negative answer? No way, Jose. They mean reciprocal. And so I first rewrite that as 1 over 3 to the positive fifth, right? 1 over 3 to the positive fifth, and that would be a positive number. A small number, but a positive number. And so this is positive for number 15. Go ahead and tell your partner if number 16, if you were to evaluate it, would be positive, negative, or undefined, be ready to share. Do the same for 17, 18, and 19. We're going to share the results with the class. Okay, it's time to play positive, negative, or undefined in the realm of real numbers. Number 16, if I took negative 2 and raised it to the 14th, I don't want to know the answer. What the value is, I want to know if it's positive, negative, or undefined. Go ahead and tell the class and be ready. So will that be positive, negative, or undefined? Cody? Undefined. So if I took negative 2 and multiplied by itself 14 times in a row, right? I'd be multiplying an even number of negatives. The even number of negatives would be overall what sign? Positive, absolutely. And so this does exist. It does exist. It would just be positive because an even number of negatives multiplied by itself would be a positive. Good, thank you. Positive is 16. So 16 is positive. Number 17, go ahead and share with the class. Luke. Negative. Negative. Raise your hand again. Negative for number 17. Negative. Good. It's okay to have a negative inside of an odd indexed radical. We just can't have a negative inside of an even indexed radical. 
So number 18 then is Tyler. Undefined. undefined. Good job. Raise your hand if you had undefined for 18. Can't have a negative inside an even root. Way to go, you guys. And lastly, the fifth root of negative 312.7 squared. Positive, negative, or undefined in the realm of real numbers. KDP? Um, positive. Positive. Raise your hand if you have positive for number 19. Positive. That's correct. If I squared the negative 312.7, I'd get a positive, and then the fifth root of a positive is still positive, so positive. Let's do a quick check. Negative to the fifth is negative. Positive base to a negative exponent is still positive, it's just a reciprocal. Negative to an even exponent, integer, an even integer exponent is going to be positive in the end. The cube root of a negative is negative. The fourth root of a negative is undefined in the realm of real numbers, does not exist. And then number 19, the fifth root of a positive number is still positive. Way to go, you guys. What questions do you have about our classification? Then it's time for closure. I'm looking for a written response for each of these. I'm going to circulate around the room, and then I'm going to call on people to share on the whiteboard. So what does it mean to rationalize the denominator? Don't call out. Just write it down. What type of exponents are allowed to have negative bases in this course? In using real numbers, which of the following are defined, and what type of number is the result? And so we're going to go ahead and say which of those are defined and what the result is, positive, negative, or undefined. So what does it mean to rationalize a denominator? What does it mean to rationalize a denominator? Mark? Um, to get rid of some of the roots on the denominator. Absolutely. We get rid of any radicals on the bottom of the fraction. I saw some varied results for number two, and I want to make sure we all understand this because it can be tricky right, when we're dealing with our exponents. What type of exponents are allowed to have negative bases in this course? Well, if we have a negative base, like negative three, right, a negative base, then we're not allowed to have fractional exponents, but we could have any integer exponent. And so my question mark could be any integer exponent, but I not just odd, I could have even. We just saw how we could have negative 2 to the 14th would exist to be positive. So it must be any integer exponent is allowed to have a negative base. Integer exponent can have a negative base. A fractional exponent cannot have a negative base. And here we go. Is it okay to have a positive inside of an even indexed radical? Yes, and the result is positive. Is it okay to have a positive inside of an odd index radical? Yes, and the result is positive. Is it okay to have a negative inside of an even index radical? No, this does not exist or is undefined. Is it okay to have a negative inside of an odd index radical? Yes, and the result is negative. Good job, you guys. What questions do you want to have our closer today? All right, then we've got our assignment number seven. I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording and save it. You can use this nice chunk of time to get going on your assignment number seven.